existing in the middle of the lush and prosperous Sundanese area, which is rich of various culture. and nature. <laughs> Becoming milestone in educating the nation. Building persons to be society servants and nation founders. Universitas Pajajaran or UNPAD was born due to the initiation of West Java leaders and government support to establish a higher education institution with various disciplines. Launched by President Sukarno on September 11, 1957, today UNPAD has a large number of institutional achievements. Such as status improvement as the incorporated higher education with A accreditation. This achievement is in line with the commitment of all policy makers in order to accomplish the vision and mission of UNPAD to be excellent university in conducting a world-class education that is able to support the nation's competitiveness through a quality learning process and innovative research. The representative learning facilities and strategic campus in the center of Bandung City, Bandung Regency, and Higher Education Zone in Jatinangor, Sumedang, make UNPAD as an excellent university in conducting education, research, and community services. Through its best programs enabling to fulfill the needs of society, nowadays UNPAD has 16 faculties and one postgraduate school, totally consisting of 152 study programs. Faculty of Law Faculty of Economics and Business Faculty of Medicine Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Science Faculty of Agriculture Faculty of Dentistry Faculty of Social and Political Sciences Faculty of Arts Faculty of Psychology Faculty of Animal Husbandry Faculty of Communication Faculty of Nursing Faculty of Fishery and Marine Faculty of Agricultural Industry Engineering Faculty of Pharmacy Faculty of Geological Engineering Postgraduate School Realizing the importance of learning process, curriculum and learning method are continuously developed in order to adjust the dynamics of stakeholders' needs. Nowadays, UNPAD has used student-centered learning method, that is, learning method focuses on students as the base to actively involve in developing knowledge, skills, 
attitude and behavior with competence-based curriculum. Supported with professional faculty members and staffs, UNPAD is capable of generating competitive and characterizing grade weights. Until now, it has registered 10,000 students from all over Indonesia and hundreds of international students studying in Universitas Pajajaran. To optimize the education and learning processes, UNPAD is supported with various representative supporting facilities, such as Library, Basic Science Service Center, Language Center, e-learning, teaching hospital, and dental hospital. In addition, UNPAD is also equipped with student dormitory, health facility, sport facility, campus transportation, banking, hall, and entrepreneurship facility such various facilities are supported with the utilizing of information technology. Besides supporting the academics quality, Universitas Pajajaran also fully supports the activity of student character building through some student unit. As a part of society, Universitas Pajajaran absolutely realizes that its function is limited not only in teaching, but also social and cultural aspects. Some social activities, society empowering, and research implementation have been conducted to give real benefits for all society. Universitas Pajajaran, straightening and developing together with society. From West Java, for Indonesia, to the world, through SDGs. Greetings from Transcendent 20 and 21. Massive open online course in Clevelet and Pellet held by faculty of Dentistry Universitas Pajajaran, collaborating with Smile Train and Indonesian Clef Center. Let me introduce myself. My name is Rashid Abdulaziz. I'm a student from faculty of Dentistry Universitas Pajajaran, Indonesia. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of us. I think it is a very great opportunity to all of us to, to get to see everyone from around the world here. Thank you to all of the participants too. Uh, and then today we are going to discuss about social care for person with orofacial cleft with an amazing speakers. We have Mr. Seth Giamfi, medical social worker from Komvo Anokia Teaching Hospital and Ghana Cleft Foundation, uh, Ghana. Hello Seth, how are you? Hi, Rasid. Um, I'm doing very well, and I believe all of you in Indonesia and also those joining from other countries all over the world are also doing well. It's a great opportunity to share my uh, knowledge and experience with you, and I thank the organizers for inviting me to be part of this program. Thank you so much, Seth. It's been a wonderful opportunity to have you here uh, with us. And thank you for giving your time. Hope you are doing well and stay healthy. And then uh, thank you so much for your interesting lectures too. We are all have watched it before this live discussion begin and we really appreciate your presence here. We also have Dr. Fahmi Oskandar, forensic odontology specialist as one of our lecturer from UNPAD and our moderators today. Uh, thank you so much Dr. Fahmi for being here. And then greetings to all of the participants. Uh, maybe, uh, first of all, I would like to explain about today's live discussion timeline. So today's live discussion will be separated into two sessions. In the first session, uh, Mr. Seth will be answering the question that has been filled out by the participant in the MOC website. The question will be presented later on screen and they'll have, they all have 
already watched the lecture video, but I think not everyone can make it into today's live discussion. But the recorded version of this live discussion will be posted in our MOC website so the other participants can watch it later. And then in the second session, the participant will have the opportunity to ask the question directly through the comment section uh, or by opening their microphone and video and ask, uh, asking the question to Mr. Seth Kiamfi. And then the second committee will have, uh, will have uh, presented the question in the screen. Okay, uh, now I would like to give the spotlight to Dr. Fahmi Oskander as our moderator and uh, Mr. Seth as our speaker. Uh, Dr. Fahmi, you can start the first session and lead today's live discussion. Thank you so much. We can move on into the first session. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Rashid. And uh, how are you, uh, Seth? Mr. Seth? Yeah, Dr. Oskander, okay. I'm doing very well. How yes, about you, as okay. well? Yes, I'm fine. Thank you. Yeah, and now uh, we uh, we start to our uh, this, uh, the first session for uh, discussion. And before that, I would like to thank for your uh, uh, excellent presentation. And then we have a, a question for you for the participant. And uh, the first, okay, okay. The first uh, question for you, what is the most challenging case of a uh, cleft lip and or cleft palate patient you have ever encountered? You can uh, uh, give explanation for this question. The, uh, the question from the Faras Sakira uh, from Universitas Pajajaran. Okay, well, um... I've, I've had a number of challenging cases um, working with persons with clefts, but the, the one which I would say is the most challenging was the case of uh, a little boy uh, who was born um, in the eastern region of Ghana. Uh, this boy was coming from a community where if you are born with any form of deformity, you are classified as bewitched. And so when such children are born, the mothers are not even allowed to see. Uh, in that community, access to um, hospital uh, care is quite limited. So uh, there are traditional birth attendants who provide maternity services to pregnant women. And so when the traditional birth attendant sees that the child has any form of deformity, they literally would do something to kill the child. Let me put it that way. And they would just tell the mother that the child didn't survive. Now, luckily for this boy, um, this traditional birth attendant didn't do anything to harm him. But then, because it was a taboo in the community, the mother couldn't bring the child out. She couldn't be happy as a new mother who has just given birth. And so, you know, there were plans to take this child to um, a fetish priest who performed some rituals so that they can uh, do away with the child. Luckily, there was a gentleman who was able to get to know about this. And he had been working with us at Confanochi Teaching Hospital. So he uh, got us involved, he informed us, and then he uh, we informed him to bring the child. He, he had a bit of difficulty bringing the child, but um, luckily um, the family agreed. They even had to, you know, run away. We had to run away with the mother and the child to come to the hospital so that the family doesn't get to know that they are taking the child out. Uh, finally, they were able to come to the hospital. Uh, a surgery was done. So when they came, the child was quite young. Um, less than a month old. So they had to stay in the hospital for the time that the first lip, that is the cleft lip had been done. So they had to stay in the hospital for at least three months before the child was fit for surgery. Uh, the surgery was done successfully and the child was taken back to the community. And it was amazing. It was amazing. 
the the kind of effects that the lip surgery had you know was fantastic so they even decided that they were going to name this child after the doctor who performed the surgery and that also gave us opportunity to use it to educate not just that community but the surrounding communities who also shared in that belief in doing away with children with uh, deformities like cleft and we went there we organized um, a community education and it was fantastic the people saw pictures of children whose deformities were even severe than that child and who we have been able to perform the surgery and they were looking fantastic and so i believe this case was uh, a, a challenging case it was a test case for us and through that we were able to educate the people and now that issue where children with cleft were abused is no more happening in that community so that is um, a challenging case that I can share with um, the participants. Okay, uh, it's very interesting, yeah, your uh, experience, and thank you, your uh, your answer. And then the next question: How do you do handle the cleft patient who is abandoned by the parents? Okay, so. When a child is abandoned, sometimes um, they, they are abandoned somewhere and then they are found by people, they are reported to the police and then they are brought to the hospital. So, but sometimes also the parents will just tell us that we don't want this child because of our cultural beliefs. And we've had a number of cases where they, they, they told us in the face that we do not want this child. If we take this child to our community, the child won't survive. But because we don't want to do anything bad to that child, that is why we have brought the child to the hospital so that you can take over. So when it gets to the point where uh, all efforts are failed for the parents to take the child and accept the child, um, in Ghana, you, you, before you can relinquish your rights as a parent, you have to swear an affidavit. So you go to a court and then you take an order that you don't want to uh, accept your responsibilities as a child. And so you are relinquishing your rights as a parent or your responsibility as a parent to the state. So when that is done, then there's a department in Ghana called the Department of Social Welfare and that department handles issues of uh, parents abandoning their children or children who are abandoned by their parents. So we will, we will get uh, the Department of Social Welfare involved. And then um, if the child has the, the cleft deformity, the child will continue to stay in the hospital and treatment will be provided for that child. And after the treatment, the child will be taken by the Department of Social Welfare to a residential home for children where the child will be cared for. And then as far as there, usually uh, uh, people also uh, apply for adoption or for foster care. So if somebody is interested in adopting that child or fostering that child, then the Department of Social Welfare would take that person through the needed uh, processes and the person will provide the needed documentation and the person will become uh, a legal parent for the child or a foster parent for the child. So that is how we uh, deal with issues of um, abandonment of, of children with uh, clefts. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you uh, for your uh, answer and explanation. Uh, Mr. said, we continue the next uh, question. Uh, what is the most common psychosocial issues that the patient or parent experience? Okay. Um, usually the parents are the ones who face um, the psychosocial issues because the, the children most often are young. And so um, you cannot be able to tell whether that child you know, is having any psychosocial issues. But from the point of view of the parents, you can know that uh, they are going through some challenges. So 
mostly uh, in Ghana, uh, we don't have a lot of cleft centers. Uh, the few that are available are located in uh, the major cities of Kumase and Accra. Uh, it's just recently that we have one of our doctors going up north to uh, uh, begin uh, cleft services there. So uh, one of the most common um, challenges is the issue of transportation. Um, moving from where they are to the city centers to uh, get um, cleft care is uh, a big challenge. And most often some of these people come from very um, low social income groups and they are not able to afford the cost of transportation. So that is one challenge that um, the Ghana uh, Clef Foundation, which I associate with, helps our patient. The other uh, is the issue of um, the lack of support from family members. Um, in some communities in Ghana, when a parent gives birth to a child with cleft, um, they, they are considered as um, uh, people who have bad women, and so people don't want to associate with them. So they are abandoned uh, by their family. So uh, they are women whose husbands or whose male partners will abandon them, saying that uh, they have brought um, something bad to their family. And so they wouldn't want to associate with that child and, and therefore they would abandon the mother and leave their mother to single-handedly uh, cater for the child. And where the mother doesn't have the means to provide the needed care, it becomes a big challenge. As I mentioned, if she has to travel regularly to the hospital and she doesn't have the support of her family or the partner, uh, it becomes um, a challenge. I believe that um, uh, with my experience from when I started now, I believe there's been a lot of awareness that has been created. And so uh, the issues of abuse, I wouldn't say it has gone down completely, but it has reduced drastically than where I first um, saw it when I began my work with Cleft. Uh, the issues of financing is still a big challenge. Um, people uh, in cleft care, some part of it is paid for by insurance, but some of the services, for instance, um, anesthetic drugs, anesthetic services are not paid for by insurance. And so if the parents don't have the means to pay for these services, they will have challenges. But the Ghana Cleft Foundation is doing its best to support um, such parents who are not able to afford uh, these services so that they can have uh, the best of care. So these are some of the uh, common psychosocial issues that uh, parents and patients face. Also, the issue of the trauma, especially when a new mother has given birth, mostly I ask them, what was your first you know, um, emotion upon seeing your child with cleft? And most of them will say, I was afraid, I cried a lot. So that psychological trauma of seeing your child, usually when that is the first child and that child comes with a cleft, or that is um, a child, maybe they've had other children, but this is the child that uh, they are having who has cleft. It has a lot of um, traumatic um, experiences, especially um, for the mothers and some of the fathers as well. But we do our best to counsel them, assure them that uh, these are issues that can be dealt with. We show them pictures uh, of uh, images of children who had cleft and we have been able to repair. They come to the clinic, they see other children, and that serves as a form of social therapy when they see other mothers, other parents, other children coming there and they see that they are not just the only person who have given birth to uh, the child with cleft, but there are others as well. It gives them some hope that they are not just the uh, only parents who have uh, children with cleft, and that helps us to uh, deal with the challenges that uh, they are facing. Okay, thank you for your explanation. And the next uh, question, uh, have you ever met a case where the cleft patient took his 
or her anomaly as taboo. How do you manage this type of fashion? Is there any specific approach we can use to correct their mindset so that they could get a proper care? From Mutiara Azara, yeah, Universitas okay. Pajacaran. Uh, thank you for this question. Um, I have not met a patient who took his or her anomaly as a taboo, but I have met parents who took the condition of their children with cleft as taboo. I've met several of them. Um, like the example that I cited in the challenging case, that was a case of not just parents, but a whole community uh, which considered the child with cleft as a taboo. And therefore, they didn't want that child to live. Now, uh, in that particular instance, uh, we, we, we had somebody who was able from the community who had done some work with us, who was able to bring that child to us. And after the surgery, we went back to that community to educate um, the community on uh, cleft deformities and other deformities as well. And we use that as an opportunity to tell them that if a child is born with cleft, the child is not bewitched. And then we also use the experiences of other countries that children who are born with cleft are not just uh, happening in Ghana, but it is all over the world. So we show them pictures of children from different races and cultures. Uh, so they see that the cleft is not just something which is happening in their community. And through that, uh, we are able to uh, educate them. Uh, we also uh, um, liaise with radio um, uh, stations and then we go there and then also add, um, have some talk shows about cleft, especially uh, the Ghana Cleft Foundation periodically goes around um, the country of Ghana to places where they don't have cleft services and then organizes free cleft outreaches. So when we go to such communities, we go to the radio stations and then we talk about cleft. Uh, we hang posters, pictures, uh around that community around that town so that people will see that children who are born with cleft that the, the deformities can be repaired we also use the opportunity to talk with um, the healthcare practitioners uh, and then we also recruit some of them as volunteers who when they see a child with cleft or they deliver a child with cleft they would quickly get us involved and uh, we can perform the surgery so these are some of the specific approaches uh, using the media, uh, community education, uh, using posters, also using social media are some of the tools that we use to um, educate um, our communities and our country about uh, clefts. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your explanation. And the next uh, question, we have okay okay uh, have you ever met a patient or their parent who lost motivation and did not want to continue their treatment how do you handle it from Farah Sukira Universitas Pajajaran okay yes I, I've met some parents who um, at a point you know they didn't want to come back to the hospital mostly when we went into the case why they were not coming to the hospital we realized it was because of financial difficulties because uh, when a child is born with cleft you know uh, from the day that the child is born till about when the child is about 15 13 years or even more the child will regularly will come to the hospital and especially during the early days um, every two weeks, the child will have to come to the hospital until the first surgery uh, is done. For some of these parents, it's a bit challenging for them having to bring your child to the hospital regularly twice a month. Uh, financial difficulties is something which hampers the ability for them to bring their children to the hospital regularly. And when that happens, um, the motivation is not there 
they think that why should I suffer so much for this child, especially when they have other children um, who don't have other deformities or who don't have cleft and they are not spending much on such children and they are using all their resources to cater for that one particular child, it becomes a bit difficult. Um, we, through the Ghana Cleft Foundation, where we identify that the parents have these challenges uh, financially, we support them. Some also, it's not just about the cost of transportation, but they are not able to properly feed their child. Some of them, the mothers are not able to adequately produce breast milk. And therefore doctors would recommend that they have to be given um, some nutritional support and they are not able to afford um, these um, nutritional supports or supplements that they will need for the child to have a healthy weight and a good health for the surgeries to be done. And when they, they are not able to afford that, it, it demotivates them to bring the child because constantly when they bring the child and the weight is measured, the weight is always going down. And they are not happy that they are not able to uh, afford the needed help. And so, they lose uh, motivation in bringing their child to the hospital. And so when we discover that uh, they have these challenges through the Ghana Clear Foundation, we support them. There are instances where we buy the nutrition supplement for the children so that uh, the mothers can use to feed the child. Uh, there was a case in where we liaised with one, one nutritional company who provided some of these nutritional supplements for our patients who have such needs. We also constantly provide uh, transportation support for parents who don't have the means to come to the hospital regularly. So these are some of the ways that when we um, get to know that parents have lost motivation due to some of the uh, social issues that I've mentioned, we support them. Okay, what is the main main cause uh, the, their parent lost motivation? Please come again. Can you repeat that, Doctor Skanda? Okay. What is uh, the main cause? What is the cause the uh, the parent lost motivation? Okay, so for, uh, to continue mostly, their treatment. Okay, mostly it is financial. Okay. It's financial, and as I have mentioned earlier. Um, the Confanochi Teaching Hospital um, is located in Kumase and it serves the northern part of Ghana because it is the only center which has uh, a multidisciplinary cleft team in the northern part of Ghana. And so we get patients not just from um, where it's located, but from all over, currently from about 13 out of the 16 regions in Ghana, we get patients from, so sometimes patients have to travel long distances. They have to travel like a hundred miles or even more to come to the hospital for care. And when they don't have the means of transport to come to the hospital, it will demotivate them um, to come. Some of them also, apart from um, the cost of transportation, the cost of, the cost of feeding the children who need Additional nutritional supplement is also something which uh, is a, a, a demotivating challenge. Also, other causes are the lack of family support. If there is no family support, if uh, a father is not supporting a mother uh, to come to the hospital, it demotivates them. If they have been abused, it also demotivates them to bring the child to the hospital for care. So sometimes we I have to visit the family uh, in their home. So when I first joined um, the, the, the CLEF team at Confanochi, one of the innovations that I brought was the home visit program, where we were visiting the, parent, the, the parents and the patients in their home to know their circumstances so that we can be able to adequately help them. Because sometimes when they tell you um, some of the issues that they are facing, some of them might not be entirely true, but when you visit them where they live, you get to see firsthand um, the issues that they are facing and you're able to adequately address um, that issue. So through that home visit program that we introduced at our center, we're able to 
get to know some of the challenges that they were facing and we provided the needed intervention to help deal with those challenges. And also it motivated them because seeing us coming all the way from our base and then traveling more than 100 miles to their communities was amazing to some of the parents. And when we are going, we have this cleft van donated to us by Smile Train, which had pictures of children with cleft before and after. And that van also served as a means of educating the community where we visited, because they will see pictures of children where, when they had the cleft and their pictures post-surgery, all, all looking beautiful. And that, you know, made the communities to know that, yes, these children who are born with deformities uh, are children who can survive and therefore we shouldn't kill them. So these are some of the ways that we, the home visit was one of strategies that we used to motivate our patients and also our parents and the communities that uh, they were coming from. Okay, thank you for your explanation. And now uh, we uh, come to the uh, second session. We have a question from the participation directly. And uh, the first uh, question, committee. Okay, uh, the question from uh, Siva Biandra, University Pajajaran Indonesia. Since our mental health is important too, what are the most important traits to have when facing distressed CLP patients and families? Yes, I believe um, when you are um, a carer providing care or services for patients with clefts, um, you need to have um, some emotional intelligence because you'll be faced daily with issues about your patients, uh, parents, which if you are not emotionally strong, um, you might be swayed away. So I believe that you need to have uh, that kind of mental strength. You also need to also take time for yourself as a practitioner, as a carer, so that you can have um, the um, mental strength to be able to deal with the stresses that come along with um, providing services for these um, unfortunate children and their parents. So I believe that um, as, as a practitioner or as a carer providing care for uh, patients with cleft, you need to also need to take time for yourself to assess yourself whether uh, you have the mental strength, you have the emotional strength to um, listen to your story because sometimes the stories that you hear are, are quite heartbreaking. And so if you don't have um, that capacity to accommodate all of you know, the stresses coming from the patients, it will become um, difficult. So I believe as carers, there are moments that we need to also have a break and then also take time and then also have time for ourselves so that we can have um, the free mind to be able to um, deal with the challenges that our patients come with. And that is why it is important that we work in teams, because if you're working in teams, uh, one it's, it's not just one person who is going to take on all the problems of the patient. Uh, as a team, we share. So uh, in, in our uh, center, we work in teams, and that helps us as team members to be able to have uh, the mental strength to deal with the issues that our patients can because it's not just one person who is providing all of all of the care, but it is a teamwork and that helps to um, deal with the challenges and the stresses that comes along with providing care for persons with cleft and their families. Okay, thank you for your explanation. And the next uh, question, Okay, it's finished. <laughs> okay, uh, Mr. Seth, uh, I think uh, that's all the our discussion, and I would like to thank for you, and then and then from the Ghana Foundation, 
yeah and uh, i think uh, we uh, do you have uh, have you ever been come to indonesia no i haven't i, I would love okay. to be in indonesia one day so maybe you can invite me and then i can yes come for one yeah. day for visit <laughs> maybe maybe in the future we we can to invite you to come to indonesia we can do, we can to uh, discuss about uh, social care uh, especially for the cleft lips and uh, palatal plexi yeah okay i would love that opportunity so um always always feel free to let, let me know when, when 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 you want me to come okay uh yes we have a plan for this yeah uh, uh thank you very much uh, maybe you you have a conclude for uh, the all the our discussion yes so my closing remarks uh is that um the management of um persons with cleft um entails a lot it's not just about um providing the surgery to close the gap but the social issues are also important and so as uh, carers of patients with cleft we need to pay particular attention to the social issues that they face because uh, if you do not they will have an effect on the quality of care um, that we provide to our patients and if we, we are looking at providing quality care then we must look at providing patient-centered care and providing patient-centered care for persons with cleft uh, has to deal with looking at the social issues which face them so that we can adequately provide the needed interventions that will help address uh, those issues and help provide the quality care that we seek for our patients who have cleft and so I believe that it's important that um, social care is given paramount attention when we are providing care for patients with cleft. And when that is done, the other uh, services, whether it is surgical, whether it is pediatric, would also become easier since social care is involved in all of these other services that we provide for our patients with cleft. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm very grateful. Okay uh we agree with your conclusion and thank you very much uh mr sage uh give me and uh for your time and then uh okay uh time is over R rashid yes doctor thank you so much dr fahmi as our moderator thank you so much Seth, as our speaker so uh that was an interesting closing remarks so we must pay, pay attention to the social issues because uh, it plays a big role in determining the quality care of our cleft patients thank you so much once again Seth uh, it was a great opportunity for all of us hearing the valuable knowledge from you and thank you so much uh, to Dr. Fahmi for moderating this session uh, I believe that this would be an inspiration for all of us to learn cleft lip and palate more and more, even farther, to implement the best treatment to our patients, uh, our cleft lip and palate patients. Before we end this live discussion, maybe we could take a picture first. The student, the student committees will help to capture this uh, live discussion. And to all of the participants, please turn on your camera if it's possible. Thank you. Okay. I think we could start to take a picture. Student committees, please. Uh, I will count three, two, one. Once again, three, two, one. Maybe once again, three, two, one. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Seth. Thank you so much, Dr. Fahmi. Maybe we could see each other in the next uh, occasion when the time is getting better. Okay, thank you very much, Rashid. Uh, Mr. Seth, uh, see you again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much okay. and have a great time. Okay, thank you.